Good morning everybody. Welcome to this eighth part of our series on the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. Before we begin, let's commit this time to the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just give you praise and thanks for your word. Pray that Lord Jesus, you would, by your Holy Spirit, bring revelation knowledge and understanding to your word for your word is truth help us lord to be wise in these last days and to gain that wisdom from your word we ask it in jesus name amen praise the lord well as i said welcome uh, to this eighth part of our series on the letters to the seven churches this part eight is on our final letter, which is to the church in Laodicea. The church in Laodicea. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter three. And I'm going to read from verses, verse 14 through to verse 22. Revelation chapter three, verse 14 through to chapter 22. Revelation 3.14 And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Well, here we are, brothers and sisters, on our final letter in our series, Laodicea. The word Laodicea is actually made up of two Greek words. Laos, which means, which is where we get the laity from, people, and Dicea, which means conquest or rule over and it's conquest of the people before we get into the letter proper let's as we have done for each of the seven churches have a look at a little bit of the background as to the church and where it was as I said, this is the eighth part of our series, but the final of the seven actual letters dictated by the Lord Jesus through the Apostle John, which in turn were read out to the churches in these seven cities or towns in the Roman province of Asia, which is now known as modern-day Turkey. 
a background on this city of Laodicea. The city of Laodicea was situated in the, the valley of the river Lycos in the southwest area of the province of Phrygia in Asia Minor as it was then. It was founded by Antiochus II in 261 well, Antiochus was around between, excuse me, 261 to 246 BC. And Antiochus gave the city its name in honour of his wife, Laodice. Laodice. Antiochus II, Antiochus, sorry, the second, then populated this new city with Syrians, and also Jews that came from Babylonia. The city itself stood at the junction of a, several great trade routes and this was instrumental in it becoming an important and very prosperous city indeed. Now although the city of Laodicea became very wealthy through its trade it didn't do so until the Romans, Roman province of Asia was formed around 190 BC. Until then, it was really quite a, an ordinary, quite insignificant city. Its wealth, however, came from its trade in both the black wool that it produced, obviously from sheep that produced black wool, and this was very high quality very high quality which meant that it could be used for clothing and blankets and so on and so forth and so it gained a much wealth from that it also gained wealth from the eye salve eye salve or rather the phrygian powder which was used on the eyes and this was referred to by jesus in our text we'll look at a little later the city was also noted for its banking, its finance. And there was a, was a temple in Laodicea called the Temple of Menkaru. Menkaru. This was dedicated to a Phrygian moon god. There was though quite a large Jewish presence in Laodicea of around at least, as is recorded, around 7,000 men adult men. These have been given the right to preserve their own customs within the city of Laodicea. The Christian church however was believed to have been established by the preaching of Epaphras as we'll see from the following scripture. Turn with me if you will to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 and I'm going to read from verse 12 through to verse 13. Colossians 4 verse 12 Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes, saluteth you, always labouring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and also them in Hierapolis. Now, in fact, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to this church in Laodicea, which sadly has been lost through time, but it's mentioned here in Colossians, our same chapter that we just read, Colossians 4, verse 16. And Paul writes, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. However, let's begin our study of this letter from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So let's begin our look at the letter to the believers in Laodicea. Turn with me if you're not already there to Revelation chapter 3 verse 14. And we'll read. 
and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now the first thing to note in this verse is that the titles which Jesus declares here are not taken in any way from the description that we looked at and studied in the um, introduction message, which was the first message in this series, on chapter 1 of Revelation. In fact, this is the only letter which does not draw its uh, descriptions, if you like, of Jesus from chapter 1 in Revelation. Instead, they convey the faithfulness and truth of the Lord himself. In other words, his undoubted authority. Jesus uses the word Amen, or Amen, which is the Greek Amane, Amane, and it means firm, that is, trustworthy, surely, verily, truth, truthfully. However, the word is originally from the Hebrew word, which is Aman, Aman, which in turn means to be sure, faithfulness, truly, Amen. So be it, truth. So I think it's pretty clear what Jesus is saying here. He is the truth. He is surety. Unquestionable truth. He's establishing, if you like, the facts here that he is the God of truth. As we'll see, if you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 16. Isaiah 65, verse 16. And we will read there. That he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. The God of truth. The God of truth. This, as you will see, creates the basis or the foundation from which Jesus brings condemnation and the utter faithlessness and lack of true witness in this church as we'll see as we go through this will may hopefully be made clear as we go through the the message now there comes the hard truth after jesus declares himself in verse 14 if you like as the god of truth the undoubted god of truth we read now Revelation 3 verse 15, Jesus speaking, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. And what does Jesus mean? Well, the word works here, as in each of the letters, is the Greek word ergon which means to work, to toil. By implication, it means to act. It means deeds, doing labour, work. In other words, the outworking of their and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. These are our works. Our works are the outworking of the faith which is imparted to us by God. The very sad fact is here in this verse that Jesus is addressing the whole of this church. The imagery used here is that drawn from the very water supply that came in and through Laodicea. This water supply flowed through the city. The water came from hot springs some distance away in Hierapolis 
So by the time he got to Laodicea and had met colder water from Colossae, it was tepid or lukewarm. Boy, there, is, there was no better way for Jesus to describe this church than the very water that flowed through it, through the city. Tepid, lukewarm water. I'm sure that any of you who have, when you're thirsty, have, have been offered lukewarm, tepid tea or coffee, it's, it, it just makes you go, Wah! And you just want to spit it out. It's neither cold and refreshing or warm and edifying and soothing. It's neither one or the other. And this is exactly what Jesus was saying about this church. And it should be obvious from this statement by the Lord that he's referring to their spiritual walk. This church... The people in this church, rather, were neither fervent in their faith nor outworking of that faith, nor were they outwardly in rebellion to the Lord, denying the Lord. They were, however, if we can say, put into a phrase, putting on a show. Putting on a show. Brothers and sisters, there are Many examples of this same kind of behaviour in the body of Christ today. I say this with sadness, but I believe it is a the truth. There will be churches who have a magnificent variety today of groups, of group works, if you like, in place. They will have lively worship services performed by skillful, almost professional groups, a burgeoning children's work, prayer groups, Bible studies, and possibly even outreaches into the community, such as coffee mornings, bingo, parties, and so on and so forth. However, underneath all of this will be a complete lack of solid biblical teaching which would equip the body for the hardships of life in this world. Teaching people how to live in a fallen, wicked world as sons and daughters of the living God. How to display the spiritual characteristics of Christ himself in that fallen word, world. Sorry. And it will neither nurture the flock, nurturing spiritual gifts which have been birthed in individuals in that body, and so on and so forth. This is what the church in Laodicea looked like, just like much of the church, especially, sad to say, in the very prosperous West today. It's all froth and no substance. This is what was spoken of by the Apostle Paul here in our following scriptures. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness 
but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. I think those are very strong words from the Apostle Paul to this young pastor, Timothy. This kind of behaviour, this kind of walk for so-called believers in Christ, so-called members of the body of Christ, I am sure, infuriates the Lord Jesus. As we're going to see from his next comment to this church in Laodicea. Revelation 3 verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now that's not a very nice phrase, is it? I will spew thee out of my mouth. It's something you wouldn't expect to come from our Lord Jesus Christ. But such is his infuriation and anger with this church. It drives him to use these words. I want us to look at the wording here just for a moment. The word lukewarm is the Greek word kliaros, kliaros, which means tepid, lukewarm. It means metaphorically, it means the condition of the soul wretchedly fluctuating between torpor and fervent love. Torpor is laziness, inaction. It's neither one thing nor the other. The word cold is really what you'd expect it to be. Sucros, sucros, which means chilly, cold. It means what it says. Chilly, cold. The word hot is zetos, zetos. It means boiled, and that is by implication, khalid, fervent, hot, earnest, boiling over. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, the word spew here in our verse from the Lord is emeo, emeo. And this means to vomit, to vomit forth, to excuse the phrase, but it means to throw up, to be sick. And it's from this word that we get our medical word, anti-emetic. And that's something which will prevent you from being sick, from vomiting. So from this, you should understand that the Lord can do something with someone who is either hot, fervent, burning, or someone who is cold chilly but is so repulsed by someone or a fellowship such as Laodicea that is tepid or lukewarm that it will cause him to expel such from his body that's what being sick is isn't it so when you spew something out you you discharge it from your body and that is exactly what Jesus is saying here. Such is the lukewarmness, the tepidness, the tepid state, the can't care less attitude, or the self-interest in this church, that he is going to expel them from his body, the church. Remember, Jesus is the head of, we are the body. We are part of him. We are part of Christ. And he is part in us. He is the head. But he is going to expel this church and those like them from his body, the church. Then Jesus goes on to explain this strong statement. Revelation 3 verse 17. Jesus' words, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, 
and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Here in this verse, Jesus explains what he means by the phrase lukewarm with regard to this church and to all who are like this church today. It is really what I stated earlier, that this fellowship seemed from the outside to have everything going for it. Sadly, however, as with many fellowships today, it is all show and no real substance. Relating this to today, we see that there are many fellowships that have a name for being lively, that have attracted a large congregation, possibly main, mainly younger people, because of its variety of worship, its form of worship. And there's a wide variety of activities, always keeping people busy and excited. Maybe a building project to increase the size of the sanctuary or whatever. However, there is no real depth to the salvation of the people within the body. They think they have achieved great standing with the Lord because of the size of their church, the vitality in the church, the size of the congregation and the size of their burgeoning building projects and so on. Many, many people may be coming into the church, but really, let's look at it. Are they being born again? Are they as a, as a result of people within the church evangelising their friends and family, seeing them come to a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and then being added to the fellowship? Or are they people coming from other churches because the music is more exciting, more lively? Because the word that is preached isn't a challenge to them, that it doesn't convict them, it doesn't make them feel uncomfortable. I want you to think about these things, brothers and sisters, because this is what was happening in Laodicea, and it's what will happen and is happening in the last day's church. Paul, we already read about it in Timothy, wrote about it what he saw prophetically as coming to the body of Christ. The problem is though, in all these things, is that the heart condition of the believers, that both the Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus are most concerned with, and not the size of the building or the liveliness of the worship service. It's the heart that God and the Lord Jesus Christ are concerned with. It's the heart condition of believers that the Godhead is concerned with. Not how big your building project is. Not how exciting the worship service may be. Not how many children are in the, in the children's work, in the crash, or how big the building project and plans for the future may be. God looks on the heart. He always has done, and he always will. Let's look here. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. Matthew 15, verses 1 to 9. Verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do the disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they do eat bread. But he, that is Jesus, answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honour thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. 
But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honour not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrines the commandments of men. Yes, brothers and sisters, before you say it, I am aware that Jesus was addressing the Pharisees here. But the meaning is the same. The sense behind Jesus' words are the same. They were following rigidly to the letter of the law. But Jesus was emphasising the spirit of the law. It's not the observance of rules and regulations, but rather a loving relationship with the Lord himself. To put this more simply, there's a difference between making plans and then expecting the Lord to bless them. And conversely, seeking the Lord in all things before we do them and then being obedient to his subsequent direction. For as the following scripture states in 1 Samuel 15, 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in the obedience of the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. In other words, to do what the Lord has told us to do, and is telling us to do, is better than all the sacrifices that we can make, or the offerings that we can bring. I want to speak more about this specific subject in the final overview message that will come next time about this series. Suffice here though to say, having a large building, having a large congregation, having loads of money in the bank, and having an attractive, exciting worship service are no proof. Listen to me. These things are no proof that the fellowship or the people within the fellowship are right with God. As this letter, I believe, proves without shadow of doubt. Sadly, it rather proves the reverse, in fact. Let's look at the cure for this what I've called self-deception of Laodicea. As a result of their self-deception, this is what I believe is, is happening here in Laodicea and what is happening in the church in the last days. Self-deception. Jesus then delivers the only resolution for such a condition. It's a, the only resolution for the, those in Laodicea and it's the only resolution for the last days church, the body of Christ in the last days. Listen to these verses, brothers and sisters. We're going to look and read Revelation 3 verse 18 now. The next verse of our text. Verse 18, I counsel thee, this is Jesus speaking, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou may be rich, and white raiment, that thou may be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, 
and anoint thine eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. I believe these words are some of the strongest that Jesus have used, has used, especially in these letters. Their problem, remember we're looking at the church in Laodicea, reflective of the church of the last days. Their problem was they had gotten into the sad state where they believed that they no longer needed any help from the Lord. They saw their prosperity and their knowledge and so-called wisdom as proof that they had made it. They were perfect. They didn't need anything else from the Lord. Jesus, however, cuts right through this self-deception because that's what it is self-deception and he shows them that it is quite the reverse in fact they are indeed wretched in his sight they are as paupers beggars and the street they are naked shameful in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. This fellowship who had great wealth and prosperity and a big congregation thought that they were the bee's knees but they were in fact wretched, paupers, beggars, hobos if you like in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have forgotten that this world is not our home. Remember that, brothers and sisters. This world, this world is not our home. We are sojourners. We are strangers in this world. We are here purely to reflect Christ Jesus and his word. We are children of the King. We are not to submit to the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, nor the pride of life. We are instead to look to Christ and the life to come in him. Jesus then counsels them first to buy from him gold tried in the fire. Strange thing to say, isn't it, to a wealthy church, to buy from Christ gold tried in the fire. What is this gold? Well, gold, like any other metal, especially precious metal, gains its increasing levels of purity from being repeatedly put through the refiner's fire, so that more and more impurities may be removed, leaving it more and more pure, more and more costly, more and more precious. A child of God, similarly, must endure hardships, temptations and trials, as indeed did our Lord, in order that more and more of the flesh life is replaced by the life of of Christ. As is written of Christ by the writer of Hebrews in our next scriptures, Hebrews chapter 2 verses 9 to 11. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 9 to 11. Hebrews 2 chapter 9, uh, Hebrews 2 verse 9, sorry. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect 
through sufferings. Underline that, brothers and sisters, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Do we have to endure sufferings? Yes, we do. Why? Because Jesus was perfected through his sufferings. Verse 11, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Why is he not ashamed to call us brethren? Because we too are allowing ourselves to be perfected through the sufferings that we endure in this world. Why do we suffer them? Because this is not our home. This home is governed, if you like, by the devil. It's the home of wickedness, corruption, infidelity, fornication. We are not of this world. We are of our Lord. So then, what do they do? What they are to do, sorry, is to trust in him, the Lord Jesus, to give them of his strength so that they may endure all things, that they may be conformed to his likeness. As seen here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. Peter writes that the trial of your faith, remember, it's a trial of our faith to be in this world. <clears throat> that the trial of your faith, yours and mine, brethren, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Natural gold will perish when God judges the earth. The elements will be dissolved. Everything will be destroyed. But that which has been tried by fire, our faith, our life in Christ, to the praise and honour and glory, glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a wonderful verse that is. What a fantastic, glorious insight Peter was given there. That the reason why we must endure trials and tribulations that the trial of our faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Moving on. Next, Jesus said they need white raiment. This, of course, signifies the garments of salvation. Or, Indeed, the wedding garments that we will need to be allowed entrance to the marriage feast of the Lamb. I could go deeper into this looking at, the, at what Jesus says of the marriage feast in Matthew, but we don't have time. Read it for yourselves. We must keep an attitude of humility before the Lord. These garments must be kept spotless and clean, brothers and sisters. They've been given to us by the King. We must keep them clean, spotless, washed in the blood of the Lamb, keeping short accounts with Him, bringing our faults, our sins before Him, in humility and repentance, keeping our garments clean and allowing the Holy Spirit to bring into the light any and all wrong thoughts or deeds when they occur. Confessing our sins in repentance keeps us humble before our Lord and Saviour. 
and prevents us from becoming like they in the church of Laodicea who thought they didn't need anything from the Lord. We need everything from the Lord. That's the whole point. He is our Lord. He is the head. And from, from him we receive all things that we need. Next, interestingly, is I salve. Did you see that in our verse in Revelation 3? He encourages them to use I salve that they may see. This is a reference, as I said earlier, to the I salve that helped to make the city wealthy. It was this Phrygian powder that was used to help natural eyesight. Here though Jesus is exhorting them to give up their trust in their own spiritual wisdom and reason, their own wisdom, their fleshly wisdom and reason, not spiritual, sorry, their own natural wisdom and reason. He wants to, them to give up their own wisdom and reason, instead to trust in the wisdom of the one who has already walked this path and gained victory over the world, the flesh and the devil. It's similar to the discourse that, we, that Jesus had with the Pharisees here in John 9, verses 39 to 41. John 9, verses 39 to 41. Verse 39, and Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. They saw in their natural sight, in their natural abilities. They did not have the eyes of Christ. They did not have the imparted wisdom and understanding that comes from Christ through the Holy Spirit at regeneration. So they remained in their sin. So are those who believe they don't need anything from the Lord. But then Jesus brings correction in love. What do I mean by this? Well, the chastisement of the Lord is always with the aim of bringing the sinner to repentance. In love before it's too late. That is always the heart of Christ. It's always the heart of God. Revelation 3 verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Jesus loves his people. He loves the bride. He loves the church, the body. Of Christ he died for it and as many as he loves he rebukes and chastens as a, a, a natural father would do his child those children that we love we correct them we rebuke them when we see them going wrong so that they may learn and grow so it is with Christ, who is perfect in his love. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, Jesus says. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. When you are rebuked or chastened, Jesus is saying, Be zealous, therefore. Hear, heed the words, and repent. Surely there's no greater proof 
of the love of Christ for his church, his chosen ones, than to offer forgiveness to those who are black, backslidden and rebellious by the pain of correction. As the writer of Hebrews so aptly puts it, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 8, Hebrews 12, 5 to 8, verse 5, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. In other words, you are not of Christ if you are without chastisement, because you don't belong to him. Even to a church, a people who are so wayward in their ways as the church is today, as was Laodicea, just prior to the great judgment of this world, the call of love from the Lord is loud and clear. Humble yourselves and repent before it is too late. There is still time to repent and to be cleansed. But that time, brethren, is growing shorter by the day. Let, remind, let me remind you that none of us knows exactly when the Lord may return. Or even more starkly, None of us know when we individually may be taken by death. Thus, the enduring urgency of the call to repentance by our Lord and Saviour. Today is the day to put things right with your King. Next, we have the, the call to come. The call to come. Let's look now at Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Oh, brethren, this verse breaks my heart. This is a very sad picture. It refers to Jesus standing at the door of the believer's heart, knocking to be allowed in. Is there any more sadder picture than this in the church? He will never force himself upon anyone, but rather waits to be invited in. Even here, to a fellowship of believers who have strayed so far from the truth, that they are trusting in their own wisdom and prosperity, believing that they have no longer any need of anything from the Lord. There is the offer of a way back into his fold. Oh Lord, what a glorious God we serve. What a glorious and merciful Redeemer. I won't go deeply into it now but this reminds me of the betrothed woman and her bridegroom in the song of solomon there are two different scenarios played out in that that uh, song of solomon one is where the bride is ready for the coming groom and the other is where she misses him because she has not made herself ready for his return and when he knocks on the door she is already in bed and doesn't bother getting up. And when she does get up, the Lord has already gone. The bride has gone and the door is closed to her. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to read the Song of Solomon for yourself once again. 
because it's a picture of the last day's church and the choices that we face. You will either be prepared and be taken to the marriage feast or you will be unprepared and left outside. As confirmation of what I've just said, here is Jesus' next statement in this letter to the church at Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in his throne. To him that overcometh. This is a direct challenge to all who would put their trust in this world, the flesh or the devil. These things must be overcome, brothers and sisters. All these temptations, these trials, tribulations, temptations, can only truly be overcome in Christ. In other words, we must be in and found to be in Christ Jesus and him in us in order to overcome at all. The promise to all who are found to be in Christ and who overcome is that they will rule and reign with him. To be in his throne means that we are joined to heirs with him in his kingdom. What a wonderful promise that is, brethren. What a wonderful promise we have. That promise is sure and true and trustworthy. That if we are found in him, we will be as he is. We are joint heirs with him and will be in his kingdom. And so after all of this, at the end of this worst of all the seven letters sent to the churches by Jesus through the Apostle John. The message is crystal clear. I believe it is. After all of the warnings set down in these letters, here is the final warning of all. Revelation chapter 3 verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Yes, it is the same warning in each of the seven letters, because it is the same warning that Jesus speaks to us today. Hear what the Spirit is saying in and through these letters. Hear and obey. Heed the word that has been spoken. These seven churches are long gone. They no longer exist. Your church does. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ does exist and endures today. It's the same warning to all of us. Hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church, to these particular seven churches, and also to the church in the last days. Your church, my church, your fellowship, my fellowship, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We must underline this, we must heed all of the warnings and instructions of the Lord of Lords and King of Kings and obey them if we are to make it to the marriage feast of the Lamb. I hope the message is clear to you brothers and sisters. These letters to the seven churches were given for a reason. They were given to these seven very real church fellowships 
in their own time and place. But they are revel rel relevant sorry, to us today in our own time. Because the day of the return of our Lord Jesus is drawing near. Near, much nearer now than it was 2,000 years ago almost when these letters were sent to these churches. The message is relevant now, more so than ever before. If you want to make it to the marriage feast of the Lamb, we must heed, learn, understand what Jesus is saying through the Holy Spirit, through these words. It's my fervent wish and desire and prayer that each and every one who is listening to this word and who reads the words of God in the Bible, Old and New Testament, that you will make it to the marriage feast of the Lamb, that your garments will be clean, that you will be found to be in Christ and in the faith. In my final message, which will come next time on this series, it will be an overview of looking at all that Jesus has been saying to through these seven letters to the church, the church of the last days, an overview message, if you will, which will take an overall view of what these setters, seven letters mean to us today. I hope to draw all of the points together in order to give a coherent message for the body of Christ today. Brothers and sisters, please read these letters. Please read the proof scriptures that I have given, the back up the points that have been brought. Until we meet next time, and so until we do meet next time, round the word of God. May God bless you richly and keep you spotless before the Lamb. God bless you.